Hi, I'm Janice Poplack, Director of Social Work at the Menninger Clinic, and I'm here with Dr. John Allen, Senior Psychologist here at Menninger, and also a Professor of Psychiatry at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Allen has written and lectured extensively on the topic we are going to discuss, which is trauma in attachment relationships. Hi, Dr. Allen. Hi. Thank you for being here. Glad to be here. Well, tell us, how do you define trauma? Okay, well, let me start by saying we use trauma in two different senses. Sometimes we use trauma to refer to the events that were so troubling for a person. So, so the, well, the trauma of the assault. But then we also use trauma to refer to the lasting negative effects of going through extremely stressful events. So trauma in the sense of being traumatized, that's what I'm going to talk about uh, mainly. And one thing I want to say about the word trauma, it's, there's no bright line that, you know, you say, well, you know, this, well, this wasn't quite traumatic. Yeah, that was traumatic. I mean, it's a continuum. And the continuum is stress, from mild stress to extreme stress. The extreme stress can be traumatic. So is trauma the same as post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD? No, it's not. It's, it, it's an important question. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is the one psychiatric disorder that you have to have been through some traumatic events in order to have this diagnosis. So that's how the two are linked. Let me just say a bit more about post-traumatic stress disorder. Essentially, it's like an all or none reaction. That when you are tr have post-traumatic stress disorder, reminders of trauma tend to bring back that experience. So you have these extreme intense emotional reactions to reminders of trauma. And at the extreme would be flashbacks, as if you're actually, it's as if you're feeling like you're back in that traumatic situation with these powerful reactions. So if you think about that naturally, somebody who has those reactions is gonna try to avoid anything that reminds them of trauma. Try to stay out of situations that would remind you of trauma. Try not to think about it, talk about it, and so forth. So you get this oscillation between avoidance and at worst really constricting your life and then this very strong reactivity. So that's the crux of post-traumatic stress disorder. But there's a, a bit more to it. Another thing is hyperarousal, feeling anxious, chronically anxious and irritable and then negative thoughts and feelings that are connected with the traumatic experience. For example, feeling scared a lot, feeling angry a lot about what happened. A big one is feeling shame or humiliation for what you've gone through. And then the thoughts that go with it, some of the most important problematic thoughts are, it was my fault, I'm terrible, I'm worthless, I, didn't, I shouldn't have been there, I didn't cope well, and so forth. So, so all of those together uh, constitute post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, you've talked about the idea of the 90-10 response. Mm. What is that? Well, the numbers are arbitrary, but the basic point is that you can be sensitized to stress. Now, think about desensitization. You know, what we'd hope is the more you're exposed to stress, mm -hmm. the more you get used to it, the calmer you are. But sensitization is the opposite, that the more you're exposed and the more severe the stress, you can actually get more and more reactive to stress. So the way we think about it, these reminders that kind of trigger post-traumatic stress disorder, it's like 10% of the emotional response is from the present and 90% from the past. So we use this 90-10 idea because it kind of helps people understand why they're reacting. It's not uncommon for people to criticize somebody with PTSD. Well, you're making mountains out of a molehill. Well, what I say to that is there is a real mountain in the past of trauma, and that's what your nervous system has learned to do, is make mountains out of molehills for the sake of protecting you so that you're always going to be ready to deal with uh, some kind of stress. Well, then, does trauma contribute to other psychiatric disorders? Yes, by all means. If you think of psychiatric disorders, just broadly speaking, 
that all of these disorders are made worse, exacerbated by stress. Mm -hmm. Virtually all of them, maybe all of them. So actually, if you think about trauma and the kind of reactivity that I just talked about, this is going to contribute to depression, to other anxiety disorders, potentially to substance abuse, eating disorders, dissociative disorders, people feeling kind of numb or spaced out. And even we're going to talk about a trauma and attachment relationships, which can start early in life, can actually shape personality and contribute to personality disorders. So I think it's, PTSD is way too narrow for the effects of trauma. It really covers a great deal of psychiatry. The other thing is it goes beyond psychiatry in ways that are important. I think about the existential spiritual aspects of trauma, particularly the kinds of th trauma we're going to talk about, where people have done things that are just, you know, horrific to other people and traumatize them, you know, this can lead to feeling cynical, bitter, pervasively distrusting, resentful. And for many people, uh, it really challenges their faith, spiritual faith, challenges their belief in God. How could this happen? How could we have a good God and people do these horrible things? So it has these broad existential impacts that go way beyond psychiatry. So does the nature of the traumatic event matter? Definitely. Um, broadly speaking, one thing that's important is the distinction between a single traumatic event and repeated events. Generally speaking, of course, repeated events are going to be much more challenging. And I don't mean to minimize a single horrific event, like sexual assault, for example. A single event can be profoundly traumatic. But a lot of what we deal with is, is a kind of pile-up of traumatic experiences over the lifetime. The other thing is, um, I think of a spectrum of interpersonal involvement in trauma. So you can think of impersonal trauma, like a hurricane or an accident. You know, nobody did it. And then in contrast is interpersonal trauma, where th either through c kind of um, you know, ill intent or negligence, somebody does something that is hurtful. This, whether somebody's involved, another person in the trauma is very important. And then we have in interpersonal trauma, attachment trauma, which is that the person who really inflicted the trauma is, that's in the context of an attachment relationship, which means that this is somebody you depend on for a sense of security and comfort and so forth. So that kind of involvement makes, uh, I think, a very significant difference. So could you say more about attachment trauma? Well, the essence of it is you know, it's a relationship, again, in which there's a, re a close bond uh, and one of depending emotionally on the person for security. So what happens in attachment trauma is that you have, the way I think about it, it's a combination of something that produces very powerful, painful emotions. Fear, terror, anger, rage, uh, shame, humiliation. Very strong emotions, but in the context of feeling alone, in the sense that you're psychologically alone, that you're going through these emotions, even though a person may be involved in the trauma, they are not tuned into you. If they were tuned into you, presumably they wouldn't be inflicting such pain. So there's this kind of disconnect from somebody and in, a, in an attachment relationship, somebody who really should be caring is producing intense distress and failing to relieve that stress. The word I use is invisibility. This is what's so painful to people who are in this kind of trauma is that they feel psychologically invisible and in great distress. That's what I think is traumatic for people, actually. Why then is um, attachment trauma so potentially problematic? Well, the thing is, if you think of attachment relationships as our main way for, for getting a sense of security and comfort when we're hurting, when we're in pain, when we're distressed, these relationships should be the main source of healing. But with trauma, you have insecurity in those relationships and potentially extreme distrust 
So attachment trauma blocks the avenue for healing from trauma because we learn to fear what has hurt us. So with attachment trauma, what you learn to fear is depending emotionally on other people. And if you're traumatized, what you most need to be able to do is depend emotionally on other people. So it, is it true that if someone has endured trauma, um, that they would be uh, most likely to repeat it themselves? Well, I would say not necessarily going to repeat it, but quite often uh, this is a problem because you not only have past trauma, but the re-experiencing of it, not just in your mind, but in current relationships with attachment trauma. Let me just give you an example of how this can happen. So attachment trauma produces insecurity in attachment relationships. Now, a trigger for PTSD is some disruption in a relationship that reminds you of the past trauma. So say you have a dispute or a conflict or an argument, or say you're, the person you're depending on doesn't show up, they don't follow through with a commitment. Or what often happens, you know, you're hurting and this other person is preoccupied or distressed, uh, you know, and so they're, they're not, they don't want to deal with your stuff, okay? This is ordinary human stuff. But you see with that 90-10 reaction, this can trigger past trauma, then you get this intense reaction. How come you weren't there? You know, you said you'd be there, you weren't there. And then even worse, if the traumatized person engages in behavior that's destructive, like substance abuse or self-harm, then this freaks out the person they're depending on, creating insecurity in that person, and you can just see the potential for kind of snowballing vicious circles. So what are the most important things to be able to heal from attachment trauma? Okay, well, what I'm gonna say first might actually surprise you. I would say maintaining your physical health, cultivating your physical health. Everything depends on physical health. I'm just talking about basic stuff like sleeping well, eating well, exercising, being uh, very attentive to your medical health and getting good medical care. This is the foundation, because the problem is stress, and resilience is going to depend fundamentally on your physical well-being. Now, the other thing is trying to minimize stress to the degree possible, because again, we're talking about this kind of stress reactivity, the 90-10 thing, and then learning to cope with stress, mindfulness, I can't say enough good about mindfulness, about it's a way of managing stress, because we can't eliminate stress from our lives. And the other thing would be working towards secure attachment relationships, which is our mainstay of regulating distress, and that's where we get into the catch-22 with attachment trauma. Well, does psychotherapy help? Psychotherapy is really important for trauma, and there are some specialized therapies for trauma, but I'm a fan of what I call plain old therapy. And actually, I want to read a quote from John Bowlby, his, his summary. Mm -hmm. John Bowlby was the father of attachment theory. And I just love the way Bowlby summarized what psychotherapy is about. I wouldn't say Bowlby was a plain old therapist. I'm a plain old therapist, but what he wrote really fits. It's so he said the therapist's role is to provide the patient with a secure base from which he can explore the various unhappy and painful aspects of his life, past and present, many of which he finds it difficult or perhaps impossible to think about and reconsider without a trusted companion to provide support, encouragement, sympathy, and on occasion, guidance. So I think this is a beautiful summary of what people who have been traumatized need to do, because if you think that combination of being in emotional pain and feeling psychologically alone, what Bowlby describes is an overcoming of that. Now, in a trauma education group, once I made the statement, we were talking about PTSD, and I said, boy, the mind can be a scary place. And this young woman piped up and she said, yes, and you wouldn't want to go in there alone. So now, if you think about trauma therapy, that's it. 
The mind can be a scary place and you wouldn't want to go in there alone. So how can families help? Well, I think families first need to understand how trauma affects people. Um, education is very important. And one thing is I say, you know, be careful about the J word, just, if you just. See, with trauma, well, just move on. Um, you know, just put the past behind you. Yes, of course, this is what the traumatized person wants to do, but with this sensitization process and potentially with trouble in current relationships, putting the past behind you can be profoundly difficult and requires a lot of treatment. So I think these things families need to understand. The other thing is, this is it, living with somebody who's having these traumatic reactions is very stressful and bewildering sometimes. So family members n may need to get help for themselves. If they're going to provide secure attachment, they need to have secure attachments themselves. Then the other thing is, I think these relationships, a lot of the therapy, psychotherapy is great, but family work, marital therapy, working directly in the problems in these relationships so that you, you're not creating these kind of spiral reenactments, I think is essential. So family work uh, is a critical part of trauma treatment. Thank you, and before we close, I just wondered if there's anything else you'd like to add. Well, since you've <laughs> given me <laughs> the opportunity, I think one of the things that concerns me is, is that therapy for trauma is very important and helpful. But the worry I have is that you can get into therapies that are focused too much on the past and not enough on the present and the future. You can, I think we need to understand the past for the sake of understanding, well, why is it that I'm experiencing what I do, doing what I do in the present? So you need to understand that. But I think you, some people can get in endlessly exploring past trauma, which can only stir it up, and not focusing enough on, for example, current family relationships. How can we improve these relationships, and how can I function better in the present. The other thing I want to just reiterate is that, you know, we work in mental health and psychiatry and social work and psychology, but again, I think these existential spiritual issues are extremely important and that, you know, this goes beyond psychotherapy, how one finds purpose and meaning uh, and tries, sometimes I say, trying to make sense of the senseless and I think that there's, there's uh, more, more to this than uh, psychiatry can handle. Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you.